plyometrics is uh, in general, a much more new uh, type of training in comparison to uh, your traditional strength training, which we've been doing uh, for centuries. Uh, plyometrics really didn't come into play until maybe the 80s when some research started being done. Uh, it had some negative connotations that maybe it was uh, could cause more injuries and different things. And so as, as you see on the screen, have been watching, uh, you know, just kind of demonstrating some plyometrics for those of you guys who may or may not be familiar with what they are. So if we uh, dig a little deeper into how we define plyometrics, uh, what we can say is plyometrics are ultimately activities that are designed to enable to, a muscle to reach a maximal force in as short a time as possible. Uh, the way that we do this is by kind of combining actions, right? So if we look in this figure here by one of the kind of foremost researchers in this in this area, uh, um, uh, P.V. Comey, he um, is uh, a wealth of information if you're interested in kind of Googling it. Here's a kind of a weird stick figure drawing that he uh, had where you know here's our knee here here's our gastroc or soleus and our and our foot and essentially what he shows is that we can pre-activate um, muscle essentially through uh, stretch of the muscle then which allows us to uh, increase the amount of force so again it's the idea of using quick and powerful movements that pre-stretch or pre-activate as this figure shows uh, um, in order to generate really rapid force. So what I want to do next is take a look at our force velocity curve. So on this side this is our traditional force velocity curve. As we saw in the in the previous video again the the main takeaway and, and, and thought process is the fastest velocities that we are able to generate are come with our lowest force production and our uh, as our force production increases, then we have an inverse relationship. As force production goes up, velocity goes down. I'll also just point out quickly, again, you'll see here that this is the eccentric part of the contraction. So all of this on this side of the line, this would, of course, then be our concentric. Apologize for the, the poor writing there. Right. And so what we can see, again, is that there is an idea of kind of an optimal uh, force velocity. Uh, this teeters slightly on the the force side of things based on the um, on the graph that we have drawn here. So we're hovering right probably around 60% of our one rep max or our my, max isometric um, contraction here. Um, and so it gives you a good idea. So you know when we think about power training and working anywhere between that 40 to 60 uh, percent range. Um, or um, even higher for including strength and power as we kind of learned in that last section of, of, of working in the uh, more 60 to 70 percent range. Uh, that's really where we are generating the maximum amount of force in our concentric contractions. Sorry, maximum amount of power in our concentric contractions. If we look here, what we have is uh, a not so pretty, not so um, you know elegantly drawn force velocity curve here using plyometrics. So again, what plyometrics is going to do is it's going to utilize an eccentric phase, and so that's what we see here. Is we see that uh, the velocity again, as we see an increase in negative velocity, that means we're undergoing an eccentric contraction. So here's our eccentric part, and then we see this quick rebound that comes up. Um, to here and what you'll see here is ultimately our maximal force and velocity are taking place much more to the left of this so we're not really taking place in in the middle or 60 percent or so uh, our maximal power output is actually going to hover um, much closer to the maximum amount of force so again as you can see this plyometrics is going to be uh, really great at producing uh, high uh, power movements, right? So we're kind of continuing on from those power movements. So um, I think this is a, a beautiful example. Again, the idea eccentric contraction, then followed by a concentric contraction, and we generate a maximum amount of force much more rapid. So, how do we do it? There's two theories on how this works. Uh, the first is a uh, mechanical model. Uh, if you are uh, ever been an engineer or, or took engineering classes, you'll, you'll like this model uh, and the figure next, which is kind of looks like a, a circuit. If not, uh, hopefully I can walk you through it similarly well. Uh, this idea is that we're going to use the elastic energy in our musculotendon components, right? So what do we mean by that? 
Again, we mean by our tendons, of course, and then also the connective tissue in our muscle. So as that previous video highlighted, the epiperion um, endomyceum are able to provide this as well. Right, so essentially what we can do is work these kind of like our rubber band in, in our previous example. And so we can use an eccentric or a negative contraction in order to immediately store uh, or to store energy in that stretch and then a concentric action to follow it. Right. So the mechanical model looks something like um, this here where essentially we have a series elastic component that when we stretch it or pull it like a rubber band, right, stores the elastic energy that is then produced. We then have our contractile component, which is, of course, our skeletal muscle uh, that has our actin myosin uh, that are performing our cross bridges. These are going to be our active development of force, as we talked about. Right, and then we have our parallel, which is our connective tissue, right, that exerts our passive force. Right, so in the mechanical model, um, what, what happens is we will stretch both our parallel, which again is our uh, connective tissue within the muscle, and our series, aka um, essentially our uh, tendons. Uh, and when we stretch on them, they will then uh, ultimately cause a greater force. Right. So just like a, a rubber band, the idea that is if I stretch it barely, right, the amount of force that comes off is minimal. If I pull it back and stretch it, right, then our rubber band fi fires much more uh, forceful. Right. That's the exact same idea of the mechanical model. And indeed, if we look at data uh, uh, from the literature, we see that that's the exact same case. Right. So here we're looking at uh, the stretching of uh, the Achilles tendon, and you can see here's our force produced, here's our EMG activity, which tells us essentially the recruitment of motor units and uh, another marker of force. So the more, the higher the EMG value, the um, uh, the greater the uh, force that's going to be produced. So this is actually showing the rate at which the stretch is going to be done, right? So what we can see is as if we stretch it at a faster rate. Um, that we're going to generate again a higher EMG, so stretching at 1.2 uh, uh, radians per second versus 0.44 radians per second, you'll see we generate a lot more force seen in both of these curves. Right. So these illustrate the two points again that the uh, length of the stretch and the rate of stretch um, are going to uh, improve the amount of force that is produced in those myotinous. Uh, um, areas in order to increase force production. Again, that's the mechanical model looking there. The second theory uh, is the neurophysiological model. This involves kind of potentiation uh, of the muscle, which is that there's a change in a force um, or velocity um, that's caused by um, the stretch. And so that's why we demoed, again, the muscle spindles. So when spindles are stimulated, the stretch reflex is stimulated, sending input to the spinal cord uh, via our afferent neurofibers uh, after synapsing in the uh, spinal cord uh, with our alpha motor neurons, right? We then get that reflexive contraction uh, causing um, a muscle to contract, right? So again, this is a, um, a really beneficial idea. And the next question would be like, well, okay, so which theory or model seems to work? Uh, there's not a ton of literature actually on plyometrics, again, being a relatively young field. Um, but I think most people will agree that ultimately it's a combination of both the neurophysiological and the mechanical models. Both of them are going to work to improve force, right? So what does a plyometric uh, exercise look like as we break it down? We can break it down into um, three phases. Again, it employs this, what's known as a stretch shortening cycle, which is three parts, right? Uh, there's our energy storage phase through our reflex, then there's a, a waiting part of time, and then there's the concentric, right? So if we look at the eccentric phase, again, this is the stretching of the agonist muscle, stores energy in our uh, series elastic component in the mechanical model, and uh, activates the muscle spindles in our neurophysiological uh, model. 
right? And again, as we mentioned, it's probably both of these, right? Then the next uh, is called the, uh, the second phase is uh, amortization, which is the pause between the eccentric and the third phase, which is the concentric phase. This is important because again, this gives us time for those neural signals to be sent. Right. Uh, it does take time for action potentials to travel down the nerves, to travel from the afferent to the uh, motor um, or to the spinal cord, and then back down uh, the motor neurons to transmit signals. And then the last is, of course, concentric, which is the uh, kind of using up all of this elastic energy uh, released uh, and utilizing that muscle spindle to generate more force. So let's break down each of those. Uh, uh, individually, right? The first phase, um, of course, is the eccentric phase. Uh, lots of other names for it. It can be called the loading phase, the deceleration phase, the uh, yield or the counter movement or clocking phase are, are some of the, the terms that you'll hear uh, thrown out there uh, as you kind of read up on this. So what is this? This is the idea is that the tendon units of the prime movers are stretched as a result of the kinetic energy. So uh, the example here that we have is uh, taking off in a uh, long jump. So as you can see, as we kind of zoom in on this, uh, we are concentrically contracted. Our gas truck here is contracted and shortened. As we uh, get in the landing phase of the long jump, we uh, then undergo an eccentric contraction here uh, in our calf muscles, right? So in that eccentric contraction then, uh, we are, um, storing energy uh, in that in in both the in the myotendinous junction uh, as well as activating the spindles right so note that the kinetic energy may be derived from uh, preceding action so in this case we're also uh, uh, um, running uh, we can have coming from a preceding jump or we could even have the eccentric phase come from um, an external source uh, that we'll see later, such as a, a medicine ball, as, as you're doing maybe some upper body work with a medicine ball training. Again, that'll be in uh, uh, the next module stuff. So uh, one thing that I, I will point out again is that a high rate of stretch is vital, as we kind of showed earlier, uh, because this re results in greater muscle recruitment and activity. The second phase then, of course, is the uh, amortization phase. Uh, this is uh, that uh, middle phase, also called the coupling phase or transmission phase. The idea is that it allows for neural transmissions to occur in the muscle spindles. Right? This is ultimately the definitive phase of plyometrics that ultimately is going to be driving the synergistic effects uh, that we gain from this sh uh, stretch shortening cycle. Right. This is how we define plyometrics, is having this short duration uh, uh, phase, the amortization phase, um, be able to kind of use that energy that we just stored up and be able to um, um, couple it then with our concentric. Right. So the idea is that our amortization phase must be relatively short. Right. Uh, indeed, uh, the average amortization phase for most people is about 23 milliseconds. Uh, the science and studies have shown that uh, there's measurable decreases. Uh, anything longer than 25 milliseconds, uh, um, and so it's optimal to get around um, about 15 milliseconds, if you're curious. So I know most of us don't have stopwatches, nor the reflexes in order to be able to um, accurately measure that often. So uh, really the key is to make sure that when you're training this person is that there is no visible pause in the movement. Right? Again, the idea relatively rapid transmission from the eccentric phase into the concentric phase. Right. So if we look at um, an, an example of amortization, let's point out uh, a couple things. So first we'll start here, which is our, our pure concentric contraction. So I want you to note that if we draw a line here, so this, these, um, this here is essentially the amount of force produced. So if we look at this, again, the amount of force produced in just a pure concentric contraction is less than both the plyometric uh, examples. Right. So again, that's the beauty of plyometrics is we're able to generate more force in, an, in a more rapid amount of time, 
Right? So if we look at the short delay, uh, this is um, essentially trying to minimize, trying to uh, decrease that amortization time to almost none. What we see is, again, if we compare this force not the straightest line, but you can see the idea again, is that we generate more force as opposed to an almost second delay, one second delay, 0.9 seconds, uh, that yes, we still do get a little bit, but uh, you'll notice that we don't get near the force output uh, if we have a long delay. So again, uh, keeping this uh, uh, timetable uh, short. You do need a slight pause just for those neural impulses, but we want to keep it relatively short. Again, less than 25 milliseconds. So the last phase is, of course, the concentric phase, aka the unloading phase, the rebounding phase, shortening, push-off, or propulsion phase, or sometimes even considered, uh, and I like this phrasing, the payoff phase. Right? The payoff meaning we get the improved efficiency of our force generated from gaining the summation of the storage and reuse of elastic energy and the contribution of the muscle spindle reflex. So again, if we look at this in our long jump example, right, our eccentric contraction here, uh, as we lengthen our, our gastroc, we then have um, our brief moment of foot contacts and then our concentric phase where we use that to then propel us forward and allow us to uh, get increased performance in the long jump.